part on this. So let me go back over that. Today we're going to talk about the war with Mexico, not Texas and Mexico, but America versus Mexico, how that gets started and how it gets finished. And it's not really a very big war, but wars always end in death, so wars are never good. And we'll finish up today with the gold rush uh, and the idea that you could get instant riches, sort of like uh, People buy Powerball tickets, not because they necessarily know they're going to win or even expect to win, but there's a chance. The gold rush is even more of a chance, at least it seems to be, and we'll see what the reality of the gold rush is compared to the perception of what the gold rush is. And then uh, your study guide is due Monday, the whole thing, and uh, the essay portion of your test, which I'm going to go over with you here in just a minute. Uh, Make sure you, you put some effort into the essay portion of the test. It is a higher level question than what you're used to answering for me. And if you just write words, you're not going to get credit. You're not going to like the results of it. Um, and because you have all weekend, I expect good results. So uh, this is the essay portion of the test. As soon as I hit uh, unfreeze. So let's just look at it together. First of all, there's a chart below. That yellow part of the chart is actually the five themes of geography, which you may have studied back in the sixth grade, and Mr. Legrand might have talked about a little bit, uh, even last year. We don't talk about it a whole lot in here, but you know, location, place, human interaction, and environment, uh, that has a connection to the question here. But really, what you need to do is, is think about these three standards that are posted in bold and use these three standards to answer the questions up here. So let's go through it together. It is in Otis, so you have full on access to it now, but I don't want you answering this essay question during class. But think about the stuff we talk about today and could it fit in as part of your essay answer? And stuff that we've talked about recently, and we'll go over a few examples. So it says, using information learned in chapter 13, Westward expansion, manifest destiny, the Oregon Trail, trade, war, even gold rush, because today we'll squeeze that in. Explain and describe how geography of the United States, using these five themes, but focusing on human environment and interaction, movement and place. You don't have to hit on all three of those, but one of those would be fine impacted the ultimate goal of manifest destiny. So we know that God said it's our right to cover the Atlantic to the Pacific. So how does geography impact that goal? Obviously, we can talk about the topography and the physical geography because that influences movement. How so, you tell me? What gets in the way? Rivers get in the way. And make traveling on the Oregon Trail more difficult, especially depending on the time of year, if they're flooded and swollen. What else gets in the way as we head west? Mountains, like the Rocky Mountains. Even today, the Rocky Mountains are not comfortable to drive through, let alone a time when there weren't any roads. So physical geography is pretty easy. How about human interaction, human environment and interaction? Interaction with other humans, what's an obstacle that could be? Hostile Native Americans, potentially. So you can go back and think about a lot of the things that we've talked about. It could be the story of Hugh Glass and the fear of the Arikara Indians, or it could be um, westward expansion on the, the Santa Fe Trail. What was the purpose of the Santa Fe Trail? Trade and making money. What's the obstacles on the Santa Fe Trail based on what we talked about? No? There was a big flipping desert about three quarters of the way through the journey after they made it through a narrow pass in the mountains. So there's always something that stands in the way. And if we look further here, it says, uh, uh, focus should be addressed on the following standards. Recognize how trade barriers impact prices and quantity of goods. Or, so if we're going to use the Santa Fe Trail as an example, what's a barrier to trade on the Santa Fe Trail? We just talked about it the desert and the mountains. It makes it really difficult to get wagon loads of stuff to Santa Fe, New Mexico. So what happens to the price of stuff once we get it there? It's really valuable. What happens to the quantity of stuff in Santa Fe? It's small because it's really hard to get there. So the more difficult it is to get something somewhere, the more valuable that stuff becomes. Uh, that 
that's 8.2.5. Evaluate the impact of people, events, and, and ideas, including different cultures and ethnic groups on the United States. Okay, so in this instance, if we want to address 8.4.1 and westward expansion, what if we talk about uh, uh, the Mormon expansion or the growth of the, the construction of the Mormon church? Joseph Smith starts moving around and heading west. How does human interaction affect Joseph Smith and the Mormons? They get persecuted everywhere they go. So when you get picked on one place, you go somewhere else where maybe you won't get picked on. That's human interaction. Do they have issues with environment and their movement west? Yeah. Because remember, God told Brigham Young to go into the middle of a desert. So that's geography. There's always a connection with people or things. And even if we wanted to expand on the growth of the Mormon church or the spread west of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith's taken him west, trying to get away from persecution. Then they get to Missouri, and the governor of Missouri says, kill him. Well, we can't stay there. What if the governor of Missouri is friendly to the Mormons, and they settle in Missouri? Is there ever expansion into Utah? Maybe not by the Mormons. So little events in history can change the outcome of history in great ways. And sometimes it's as a result of human interaction. Wilburn Boggs, the governor of Missouri, was not kind to the Mormons. Really, nobody was kind to the Mormons. So they had to go off on their own and find a place to be. The Santa Fe Trail wasn't easy. If it was easy, what would have happened to the price and the quantity of goods in Santa Fe, New Mexico? It would have gone down. You know, what's the benefit today, for example, of having a Walmart in your community? It's easier to get stuff, and it's cheaper. The negative of having a Walmart in the community is sometimes it drives out smaller businesses that can't afford to lower their prices. So there's always pluses and minuses to things. So as you're answering these questions, you can use multitudes of examples. You know, we've talked about a ton of stuff in this chapter. So go back through your notes, see what you know. You could talk about Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. That's a cultural thing because they're bringing with them monotheism, one God, to a place where the Cayucians believe in multiple gods, and that human interaction is good and it's bad. The Cayuse and, and the missionaries tend to get along fairly well until the white men bring disease with them, and obviously that has an impact on things. And geography on the Oregon Trail and the number of the graves that we see uh, for every mile of the Oregon Trail, you've got all sorts of data and all sorts of examples throughout this chapter. I don't expect you to use them all, but grab onto a couple of them and, and dig into it. Number three there, 8.442, use multiple perspectives. What does perspectives mean? Say that again, I'm sorry. Point of view. Point of view. Is it understandable that you can have multiple perspectives and neither are wrong? Yeah, maybe Mia believes this is just an example. Mia believes that the death penalty is horrible and awful and rotten and evil. And I believe the death penalty should be used more. Just an example, people. Which one of us is right? Depends on your point of view, your perspective. Mia says, I don't think we should kill people just because they're horrible and evil people. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. So Mia says, no death penalty. And Mr. Velmi says, the Bible says, an eye for an eye. So if we have to take a life as a result of the penalty that's caused by someone who has done something horrible and evil, we should. That's just an example of multiple perspectives. Neither one of us are necessarily wrong. We just believe different things. Multiple perspectives in context with chapter 13. Did Marcus and Narcissa have the same belief system as the Cayuse Indians? Not at all. Did the discoverer of gold on the American River have the same beliefs as the guy that owned the place where the gold was discovered. Not necessarily. We have multiple perspectives that come into play throughout everything. So I'm asking you, grab onto a couple of examples, because this chapter is just full of stories. Uh, or the Mexican perspective in the war that I'm about to describe to you here in a few minutes is different than the American perspective. Probably, yeah. If you don't know that yet, then it wouldn't be difficult to figure that out. If we had the same perspective, would we go to war? We have different beliefs. So uh, grab onto that and give me two to four paragraphs, not just a bunch of sentences, uh, 
over details presented in class and other information you can find if necessary. So don't be afraid to use the internet. If you can plug some details or facts in that I didn't give you, I always sort of like that. It shows me that you, you've got to learn some research skills. That's research. So, so use the Google, but don't copy it. If you use words in your essay answer that I know are not part of the normal eighth grade vocabulary, if you use words that you can't tell me what they mean, we have a problem because you copied it. So don't do that, all right? Uh, you may use multiple examples to address the themes of geography. Again, you don't have to use all of these, even the chart itself. You can ignore it, but when it's asking you to use human interaction or human environment and interaction, down here in this chart, it tells you what that means, or movement, or place. Obviously, westward expansion is all about movement because we got to get from here to there different ways to do it. Okay, so it's a very, very broad question. It's not narrow. It's not asking for a yes or no answer. It's asking for a description and an explanation using the stuff that you've learned in chapter 13. Does that make sense? All right, so between now and then, I leave like at noon tomorrow, so I'll be around, but between now and then, if you have a, an answer, an essay answer, and you want me to take a look at it, I probably will if I'm not busy. Okay, and email uh, this weekend is a horrible time to email me asking for help. So it's a great opportunity for you to get it done and then say, Mom or Dad, could you read over this? Your mom or Dad don't have to be history teachers to read the question and think, I think you did this, or what are you trying to say? They can tell you whether your words make sense or not. Okay, so ask for help, not from your friends, but get someone involved that'll proofread it for you. Make sure it doesn't sound stupid. So uh, use lots of examples. There's tons of stuff in this chapter that you can pull from to answer this question. Uh, a couple, two, four paragraphs. And it is in Otis, so that's where you're going to find it, and that's where you're going to work on it. All right. We're flipping back to the notes, and you guys are going to tell me where we stopped. I think we stopped, like, uh, with the bear, this slide right here. After that, okay. Perfect. So we were just past this. Uh, so the title of that is War with Mexico, and it says, Mexico invades the United States. Well, kind of. We didn't want to start the war, but also James Polk's the president. What do we know about Polk's presidency? Yeah, we will go to war. It's not necessarily Mexico that he says we're going to go to war with. His 54-40 or fight is war with the British. But he's a, a war-type president. You would call him a hawk. Men or women in, in Congress or in the presidency that are in favor of war, that are looking for a fight, they're called hawks because hawks are like, raptors that, that aren't afraid of a fight. And those people that say, elect me and we'll stay in peace, those are called doves. They're a different kind of bird because doves aren't looking for a fight. They're peaceful and pretty and they make a nice noise. But I'm going to a sideshow over it and the people that are listening to this on the video, you can't see this, but I'm going over to a map. Uh, the map has a, a, the problem that we've got with Mexico. So when Santa Ana signed the document, to Sam Houston saying that Texas is independent from Mexico and then Texas wants to become a state. The problem with that document is it didn't clearly define the borders of Mexico. So we've got an issue. And if you look at this map over here on the wall, probably the one that's still down if you're watching the video, we're talking about a dispute over the part that's green and pink. America thinks it's ours. Mexico thinks it's theirs. The dispute really boils down to uh, which river is the southern boundary of Mexican Texas, or American Texas? Americans believe it's the Rio Grande River, which forms today the southern boundary of, the, of, of Texas, which also should give you an indicator who wins this war. We do. The Mexicans believe that the southern border of Texas is the Nueces River, which flows into the Gulf of Mexico here at Corpus Christi. So there's this narrow strip of land that we think is ours and they think is theirs. It flows all the way up into Texas, including parts of Santa Fe. So uh, we've got a dispute. Now, Polk's not afraid of war, but Polk doesn't want to be the one that starts the war because that just looks bad. Like, 
If I'm really angry with Logan, and I go over and punch him in the nose, teacher punches student in the nose, what is the likely outcome of teacher punching student in the nose? I'm probably going to get fired, and should be, because the teacher should not hit a student. What's the difference if Logan uh, attacks me like a fly on a cow pie, and I reach up and punch him in the nose? Then I can claim that I'm just defending myself. I had to hit him to get him off of me. Is the outcome potentially different, <clears throat> at least for me? Probably. Because I got 25 witnesses that saw him attack me mercilessly, and I had no choice but to put my arms up, and one of my hands just popped him in the schnoz and gave him a big old bloody nose. You guys saw it. So Polk has to figure out how to trick the Mexicans into starting this conflict. If I really want to punch Logan in the nose, I don't. But if I do, I gotta figure out how to get Logan to attack me first. So maybe I poke him in the ribs, or I just walk by and brush him a little extra, or I call him names. Here's what the Americans do. The United States uh, knows that the Mexicans are building a fort just on the south side of the Rio Grande River on this map. It's right here where this green starburst is. It's labeled May 8th, Matamoros. The Americans build a fort just north of the Rio Grande River, so it's in the stripy part that both sides claim, called Fort Brownsville. The only thing separating them is a the river. They can see each other. They can yell at each other. So they're probably yelling obscenities at each other. Hey, your mama wears a wig. I don't know. You know whatever. I, I don't, I'm not really good at your mama jokes. But they can yell at each other. They can throw rocks at each other probably. And, and they're hurling insults. And maybe even the Americans in Fort Brownsville, like maybe they dropped their pants and moved the Mexicans in Fort Matamoros. I don't know how this goes down, but eventually the Mexicans at Matamoros fire a couple of cannonballs at Fort Brownsville because they think it's in their territory. The cannonballs explode in Fort Brownsville, killing a handful of Americans. Now James Polk goes to Congress and says, American blood was shed on American soil in an American fort. We've got to respond. And Congress then says, we shall declare war on Mexico. So Polk tricked the Mexicans into starting. Now we're going to finish. That's how this war gets started. So when we look at it, it's a relatively small war by September of 1847. In fact, we look at the total losses here. 1,700 men are dead, uh, but another 11,000 died due to disease, not war. Wars always mean death. Even nice, simple, clean wars against weaker enemies always mean death. Someone's accidentally going to get run over by a tank if we send 100,000 men off to war in Antarctica. I don't know, that would be a pretty good war. They're fighting against penguins or something like that. But anyway, someone always is that there's always casualties of war. So what, what do you think the 11,000 disease? Is that like uh, they all got the COVID and died or what? You fight in a tropical area, there are mosquitoes. And where there are mosquitoes, there is malaria. That's the killer of those 11,000. So the hero of the Mexican War, and this is short and simple, right, is this crusty-looking old guy here on the slide. His name's Winfield Scott. He's going to be a player in the American Civil War, too, but more with ideas than with uh, fighting. Winfield Scott's looking at this, and if you look at my map over here, the pink and green map, the green starbursts are where battles take place. And anybody that's ever been to this part of Mexico where these battles are taking place, like here in Monterey or Buena Vista, if you ever go to any of this, uh, it's really difficult terrain. Again, geography would impact America's ability to fight the Mexicans. It's really harsh terrain. Part of it's desert and part of it's just scrub that would be really difficult to march soldiers through. So it, we're just crawling along when all of a sudden Winfield Scott gets an idea and he decides to put American soldiers on the Navy. And they sail down to Tampico. They resupply, and then they sail down to Veracruz. They march inland and conquer Mexico City. Where are most of the Mexican soldiers while we're conquering Mexico City? Up here in the north, nearer to the Texas border. 
So it was kind of a surprise attack using our resources, the Navy, to get us there. Mexico was conquered by the United States. We had captured their capital, their government, at least for a brief time, ceased to exist. We could have kept it all. We could have called that part of our manifest destiny, but instead, we only wanted the Texas uh, North American part that is the United States today. We didn't keep it all. It cost us $100 million, which is a lot of money back then, uh, but it cost Mexico half of its territory. You know, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, even into Oregon territory where they held claim for some time. That's a lot of their territory. So America kind of feels bad about this. And as a result, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, I think that's a fun thing to say, Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico gives up its claims to Texas. Mexico cedes or gives California and New Mexico to the United States. Thank you. We took it from them already anyway, so they didn't have much of a choice. When you lose a war, you don't really get to pick the outcome. In the treaty that ends the war, you're sort of at the will of the winners. America is the winner, so we get to tell them, we're taking Texas, we're taking California, New Mexico, and you can't do anything about it, because we've already defeated you. And if you don't like it, we can fight some more. But just because we're nice guys, we also paid them $15 million. Did we have to give them money? So any idea why we gave them money after we defeated them? All right, if we don't pay them off, they're going to hate us forever, and war probably will happen again. That's a great answer. Why 15 million? I don't really know, other than if you look at the size of the chunk of land that we took from Mexico, maybe it's similar to the size of the chunk of land that we purchased from the French. In 1804, Louisiana Purchase. So maybe that's how we came up with that number. Do you suppose if we were Mexican students sitting in an eighth grade Mexican history classroom learning about this war, their perspective would be different than ours? We see ourselves as the victors, and we see ourselves as nice guys because we gave them money after we defeated them. If you're a Mexican student learning about this, do you feel bitterness toward America? I think probably so. That's an example of multiple perspectives. Not everyone views every piece of history the same way. So if I was Mexican, I'd be like, oh, those dirty Americans stole all of our territory. In fact, even as an American, I get that. I understand that perspective. It doesn't mean I like it or agree with it. I'm glad. glad that I didn't have anything to do with it, so I don't have to feel guilty about it. But that's part of American history. Then there's one piece of the puzzle left. So to finalize the map of what is the United States today, except for Alaska and Hawaii, that's coming later, there's just one little chunk left. Now those of you that do puzzles or have ever done a puzzle, what's the most fun piece to put into a puzzle? The last one. Now, I don't know if any of you are like me, but sometimes we do a family puzzle, like we'll set up a table in the living room and we put a puzzle on it. It's usually just Hannon and I. Natalie and uh, Taryn don't get too excited about puzzles, but I'll walk by and I'll stand there for a few minutes and I'll put a few in place. And sometimes Hannon will sit there for 20 minutes and he'll, and then you come back later with a fresh perspective and you can put a few more in. Okay, do any of you do that? And if you do, do you steal one of the pieces and hide it so you get to be the one that puts the last piece in place? Yeah. That's dirty. <laughs> I do it, though, too. The unfortunate thing is, so does everyone else in the family, because everyone wants that last piece. And then by the time we get that puzzle done a few weeks later, I forgot where I hid that last piece. So there's always a chunk missing in for it. The last piece of the puzzle that makes up America, the 50-piece jigsaw puzzle, is the Gadsden Purchase. All right, this is what we bought. Ten million dollars we paid for a tiny sliver of New Mexico and Arizona. South New Mexico and Arizona. Anybody ever been near Phoenix, maybe, or south of Phoenix? 
uh, describe it. It's deserty and cactusy and dry. I don't like it. I don't like desert landscape. I'm more of a forest and mountain type guy. I think that's pretty. There are people who really like deserts, but I'm like, this is horrible. You ever go to Phoenix in the summer? How hot is it? One million degrees. South of Phoenix is even worse. The Gatsman Purchase, if you look at it geographically, you're like, what the heck? Why would we spend $10 million on this? We can't grow crops there. We can't do necessarily anything with it. That's it right there. That's the last piece of the puzzle. It's ugly. It's horrible, at least in my opinion. There's my perspective. You might be like, oh, I love cactuses and Joshua trees. I don't. So the question really has to be, why? Our puzzle would have looked just fine without this chunk. But we needed it. There's a reason. Maybe we just want to think more of Mexico. By the way, that brings up another question that we could debate. If we conquered Mexico and it was all ours, why didn't we? Difficult to control a large territory that you don't have a population of people in to control. The same reason why Mexico couldn't control Texas. It's going to be expensive. We're going to have to send soldiers there. And actually, that's a really good answer. Actually, one of the answers is very, very racist. It's full of Mexicans. And the standard of living in that area was lower than the standard of living of that of the United States. So you really want to take a poorer area that much of its resources and raw materials have already been pillaged by the Spanish several hundred years earlier? Nah, we don't do that. A horrible answer, but it's true. That's the way history is sometimes. So why? Well, it's even easier than what you think. We needed to build a railroad that connects San Antonio and San Francisco. Or San Diego, sorry. And that's the So we bought the land so we could put a railroad there. That finishes off America, except for Alaska and Hawaii, and then some other areas that will colonize uh, later on. But America, the map of what is the mainland America, the lower 48, they call it today, uh, is complete with the Gatsby Purchase. So by that time period, by 1853, we have now accomplished our Manifest destiny. God told us to do it, so we went out and did it. It cost us some lives, but we got what we wanted, and now America is home. And you can see the years here, you know, 1803, Louisiana Purchase, we take Mexico, or Texas from Mexico in 1845. By 1846, Oregon is ours. By 1848, war with Mexico, we take this territory. In 1853, we purchase this. So we've got what we want. We, we got the manifest destiny thing. I think that's like the third time that definition's been in there or something very similar to it. Uh, seed is to give. So in Mexico, seeds to us, New Mexico and Arizona, uh, California, that just means they give it to us. Well, we sort of took it and then they gave it to us. All right, let's talk gold rush a little bit. This is a good story. It's kind of fun. So there's this guy named Sutter who owns a sawmill on the American River near the city of Sacramento. Actually, he wants to build a sawmill. He owns a bunch of land in Sacramento, and people are moving to California in large numbers because it's a great place. There's good soil. There's plenty of land available. He owns a bunch of the land. He knows that people are coming, and he knows if people are coming, if they're going to live there, they're going to need to build homes or businesses. So the guy's a thinker. He's a speculator because he's investing in land in hopes that someday it's going to pay off for him. So he buys it really, really cheap, hoping to sell it for a profit later. But he also 
wants to build a sawmill. What is a sawmill? Somebody explain that. It should be pretty easy. Okay, so you take a tree and make it into boards to build stuff with. He wants to build it on the American River. Why build a sawmill on a river? There's a couple of reasons. What? Okay, so you cut the trees down upstream and float them to the mill. Mill the trees into boards, and then you float the boards to the city. There aren't any semi-trucks, and there aren't any roads, and hauling stuff by wagon isn't an option. So you're using the river for transportation. Why else do you put a sawmill on a river? That, that's kind of where we're at with getting stuff there. Right, we don't have big electric generators to run the saw in the sawmill, so a water wheel has to turn using the power of the river. It's hydropower. Now, the problem they've got, uh, Sutter sends this guy named James Marshall up the American River. James Marshall has a crew of men there, carpenters, and he says, build me a sawmill and don't come back until it's done. So these guys are working their tail off. In fact, the American River is kind of lazy and slow. It's not powerful enough. So to make it more powerful, They've got to channelize it. They've got to dig it deeper and make it narrower, at least at the point of the mill. It's sort of like what we did with the Missouri River in the 1930s when it was wide and slow and meandered. We straightened it out and dug it deeper so that barges could go on it. As a result, it's swifter than it was 100 years ago. They needed to do that to the American River. So Marshall's been digging it out and making it narrower and building and constructing. And one day, Marshall's all hot and sweaty and he's taking a little five minute break and he's just downstream from the mill. So the mill, the guys are working on it and he's kind of standing in a pool of water in the river up to his knees or so, takes his hanky out of his pocket and gets it wet, wipes down his head and his face and he scratches and he looks down and just as he looks down, the sun kind of hits the river just right and he sees all over the place, mm -hmm. almost like it's glitter on the carpet, little teeny tiny specks that appear to be gold. So Marshall's like, hmm, interesting. So he bends down in the river and he picks a few up and he looks at them and he's a carpenter. He's not a miner, so he doesn't really know the difference between gold and fool's gold. So he's kind of excited, but tempering his excitement because it's probably fool's gold. So he picks up kind of a uh, a, a palm full of these little little itty bitty nuggets. They're all over the place though. The reason they're all over the place is because gold is really heavy. As a result, when they're digging in the river, all the silt and sand and stuff are washed away by the current, but the heavy stuff, like the gold, stays where it's at. So they've created a mine right there that they didn't even intend to create. So he picks up a handful of these and he goes to the men at the mill and he's like, what do you guys think? And they're like, oh, is that what I think it is? And Marshall's like, I don't know, how do we know? And one of the guys says, well, I know one, one of the qualities about gold that makes it so great is it's really malleable. The word malleable means you can smash it. You can smash it really thin and it won't break. Whereas fool's gold, if you smash it with a hammer, crumbles. So they take one of these little nuggies and they set it on a rock and they smash it with the hammer and it goes flat and they're like, oh, I think this is real. So Marshall kind of gets excited and he picks up a little leather pouch full of these nuggets and sticks it in his pocket. And he says to his guys, I'm gonna run down the, the river and I'm gonna talk to the boss, Mr. Sutter. I gotta see what we're gonna do next. While I'm gone, y'all need to keep working. When he leaves, what do you think everyone does? I'm picking up my own nuggets, right? He's not here. The boss is gone. We can do whatever we want to do. So Marshall gets on a horse and he rides his way down to Sacramento. He gets to Sacramento to Sutter's office. Bam, bam, bam. Knocks on the door. Sutter opens the door and he's like, you idiot. You're supposed to be building me a sawmill. I told you not to come back until it's done. Go away. And, and I got a meeting anyway. I don't have time to deal with you. So Marshall probably is used to this. So he takes a seat and he waits and maybe an hour or so, I don't know how long. And then a guy walks out of the meeting and Sutter comes out and says, I thought I told you to go back upstream. And Marshall says, but sir, I think I have something that you need to see. 
Well, what could be so important that you've disrupted my day? And he takes out of his pocket this little leather pouch full of nuggies, and he pours it in his palm, and Sutter's eyes get really big, and he says, is that what I think it is? And he says, sir, I don't know. That's why I came to you. I don't know what to do with this. It might be gold. And Sutter does what any intelligent man would do. There's an assayer. It sounds like a naughty word, but it's not uh, in Sacramento. An assayer's job is to take a sample of a material or a mineral and determine what it is. Is it fool's gold or is it real gold? Does it have value or is it uh, just worthless sand? So they take it to an assayer. The assayer runs a couple of tests and he says, where do you get this? This is almost pure gold. They found the real thing. So Sutter says, take me there. we got to go now. And Marshall says, but sir, it's almost nighttime. We, it's difficult to ride in the dark. And it's raining. Let's wait till morning. And of course, Sutter now has gold fever. He's like, no, we're going now. So they ride to the mill. And all those men had done no work on the mill while they were gone. They all have little bags of nuggets. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is great. Uh, so the first thing they agree to do is keep it a secret. Don't tell anyone. Why not? We don't know how much there is, so we don't want to necessarily share with anymore. So if the 25 of us go out here and dig a hole by the football field and we discover gold, let's cover it back up. That way nobody knows we discovered it. You guys have to keep it a secret. Don't tell anybody. Promise. You all promise? Okay, you shook your head yes. Um, and we'll come back at 8 o'clock tonight. It'll be dark. Bring a shovel and a pick and some wheelbarrows. Let's get all the gold, and then we'll divide it up. Deal? Okay, how long does it take before the 550 students at Ott all know about our discovery? Lunchtime? Soon, right? Uh, so almost no time at all. Uh, how long does it take before the 700 plus students at the high school know about our discovery? A couple more hours. Because you're excited, so you're like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to tell my brother. So you send a text, and then your brother tells his girlfriend, and then she tells her father. And then pretty soon, when we show up at 8 o'clock to start digging in our hole for the gold, the whole town is there. That's what happens in the gold rush. So in a very, very short amount of time, everybody shows up in California. And they can't keep it a secret. There's just some things that are too big to keep a secret. Just in that one year period, 100,000 people rush into California. There's a reason why the football team in San Francisco is called the 49ers. Because the gold rush of 1849 was really big. Men show up from all over the world, not just the United States, but word travels really fast. Mexicans, South Americans, Europeans, Asians, they come from everywhere because they want a shot at this gold. This is big news. This is life-changing news. The word actually changes from we found this one spot on this one river in this one part of California where there were some nuggets in the river that might make a few people wealthy. By the time that word travels across the country, it's changed. Now, by the time it gets to the east or the time it gets to Asia or Europe, all you got to do is go to a river in California. It doesn't matter what river. You can close your eyes and scoop your hand into the river, and you can pull up a nugget the size of Jessica's head. Big nugget. Gold's really, really heavy, by the way, and I always like to tell this story because it makes you think when you watch a movie. You, you ever watch a movie where they rob a, uh, a vault that's full of gold bars? The average gold bar weighs 16 pounds. So when you see them just tossing gold bars into a backpack, yeah, no. You just try picking up a 16-pound weight and just give it a little toss with your, yeah, 16 pounds isn't heavy, but it's heavy. Now, how many 16-pound gold bars can you stuff in your backpack before it just goes and blows out? Probably not very many. Not going to hold 20, and then they just load them clear full, and then when they pick it up, it's just like, and they just go, no, you can't do that. It's really, really heavy, but anyway. So by the time word spreads of how big these nuggets are and how easy it is to get, and by that, Mr. Marshall there, by the way, the man that discovered the gold that started the gold rush in California died poor and penniless. He didn't benefit from the discovery. And Mr. Sutter didn't benefit from the gold 
so he did benefit from the gold rush because he's the guy that owned the land that had the wood for people to build in Sacramento. So he did prosper as a result of the gold rush, but not because of the gold itself. Here's the place on the American River where the gold is discovered. Here's a reconstructed version of Sutter's Mill. So you can see how they've narrowed it down and there's a water wheel inside that little structure that will power the mill itself. Now, We'll talk a little bit more about what mining looks like, but I always like to point out that most of those hundreds of thousands of men that went to California uh, didn't get anything. The stories were false. There aren't any nuggets the size of Jessica's head, and you certainly have to work a lot harder than just bending down and picking one up. Uh, that's not going to happen. So the people that were the smartest and most prosperous, I like to say are the, the men who mined the miners. So you got all these hundreds of thousands of miners that are down on their heads and knees in the rivers and streams and creeks of California, digging in the mud and the dirt, and they're coming out with little teeny tiny pinches of gold, and they save up their pinches of gold in a little pouch. And, and, and the, by the way, it's all men. Very few women rush to California because the men are like, I got to go, honey. I got to get there now because if I don't get there now, it's all going to be gone. So when I get there, I'm going to get a lot of money, I'm going to strike it rich, and then I'll come home, probably be gone for a year, and then we'll never have to work again, we'll never have to live in this crummy apartment, everything will be great. Or, if it's really, really nice out there and I get lots of money, I'll send for you and the kids. By the way, what do you think happens to society when it's only men? It's corrupt, it's dirty, it's filthy. Most of the guys in here will nod their head in agreement that it's unfortunate, but it's just the truth that men are slobs. It's okay to agree with me. When I was in seventh grade, my mother went to college about two hours away from home because I lived in the middle of nowhere. College was far away. So instead of driving two hours every morning and every evening, she'd leave on Sunday night and she rented a room from a little old lady. She lived in that room, went to school, studied in that room, had one cupboard in this old lady's kitchen and a little shelf in the fridge <coughs> so that it was just her stuff. And then uh, every Friday night after her last class, she would come home. So we only saw mom on the weekends. But my little brother was a fifth grader. I was a seventh grader. And my older brother was maybe a sophomore or junior. So we could pretty much take care of ourselves. And my dad was home on the weekends too. <coughs> but the unfortunate thing is when mom would leave, Nobody did laundry. The dishes were all piled up in the sink. Uh, you know, there's underwear stuck to the ceiling fan. Little brothers taped to the wall. And, and maybe not literally, but all those things are kind of true. That, that men are just slobs. We don't take care of it. And then all of a sudden, Thursday night would roll around, and my dad would be like, your mother's going to be home tomorrow. Clean up this mess. And we frantically went about doing the dishes and getting some laundry done and untaping little brother off the wall and getting this underwear off the ceiling fan because that's how men live. And then when mom would get home, do you think it was ever good enough? No. Is it like when mom says, clean your room? Is it ever quite good enough for her? No, it's not. It's not just guys that are slobs. Some of the girls are like, yeah, I'm kind of a slob too. Like Cece, she's a mess. True. Are you really neat and tidy? Okay, good for you. She can clean my house. I'm just kidding. Uh, so the, the guys that mind the miners, you know, these guys are by themselves. What do you think they do when they go to town on a Friday night? They drink and they gamble. They got a little tiny pouch of gold from all of their hard work from that week, and it's in their pocket. They keep it right next to them. And uh, they show up at the saloon. So mining the miner would it'd be a better idea than going to look for gold to take a couple wagon loads of whiskey. Open up a saloon. Someone comes into your saloon, they want to buy a bottle of whiskey. You don't sell it to them in dollars, you sell it to them in pinches. So I might say, okay, that bottle of whiskey is two pinches, which means you hold your pouch out, I reach my fingers in, I take two pinches of gold out, and I put it in my jar. So if I own the saloon, who do I want to hire as a bartender? Dudes with fat fingers, because their pinch is bigger. If I hire a, a, a woman with little teeny tiny pointy fingers, I don't give her money. So that's how they made your, their money, was in pinches of gold dust. So mining the miners was, was profitable. This guy, Levi Strauss, his real name, by the way, was on Levi. You've all heard of Levi Strauss? Blue jeans? Most of you probably have worn Levi's in the 
like that. His real name wasn't Levi, it was Loeb, L-O-E-B. He's the son of a German immigrant. And back then, immigrants, when they came to America, wanted to become American as soon as they can. So he ditches Loeb and becomes Levi because it sounds more American. Today, when immigrants come into the country, they're allowed to keep their identity. Nobody forces them to take an Englishman's name. Nobody forces them to become Connor. They can stay whatever they are. Nobody forces them to speak English. It doesn't matter. It's maybe easier if they do, but uh, Loeb is American. Anyway, his parents own a series of dry goods stores, sort of like miniature Walmarts, in the East. And they say, Loeb, why don't you expand our business? Take a couple of wagon loads of stuff out west. Everyone's in California. So Loeb loads up wagons. He's got some picks and some shovels and stuff. But he really, really focuses on one thing. He thinks he's going to make a fortune. There's this new cloth called denim. Denim is blue jean material. Except in the old days, blue jeans weren't really very comfortable because denim is really thick and really heavy and scruffy. But he's going to use it to make tents, not jeans. Jeans are a secondary thought. So he opens up a shop in San Francisco, and miners come in, and they're looking at his stuff. And one day a miner comes in, and miners at that time wore pants that were probably more similar to my khakis. How long do you think these pants that I'm wearing now would last if I was on my hands and knees in the rivers and streams and mud? Not very long. They're going to tear out. Is this really thin cloth. And miners were notorious for taking rocks that, oh, it's a rock. It looks like there might be gold in it. And jamming them in their pockets. The, their pockets were always ripping out. So a miner comes in one day. He's like, you got any pants? And Levi says, no, man, I don't. And then all of a sudden, he's planning to sell his denim and make pants for miners. But all of a sudden, ding, light bulb moment. He says, why don't you come back tomorrow? I got an idea. And Levi goes to work taking this heavy, thick denim cloth and sewing it into pants. The first pair of Levi's is born. But he not only does that, he also solves the problem of the pockets tearing out. He uses a metal rivet at the top and the bottom of each pocket. So who's got pants? Who's got jeans Daniel. on? Daniel, you got jeans on? Stand up. Stand up. You need to stand up. You can prove one. Okay, look right here on Daniel's pockets. There's a little metal rivet. That's because if he wants to fill it, you can sit down there. Thank you. If he wants to fill his pockets full of rocks, they're not going to tear out because that little metal rivet keeps it in place. It's stronger than stitching. By the way, is that still necessary today that he has a metal rivet on his pocket? Probably not. So why is it still there? I don't know. It's tradition. Is there metal rivets on your pants? There are not. Anyway, that's kind of cool. So he gets rich by creating Levi Strauss and Company. He makes jeans. So these guys, a very few strike it rich, except if I come with picks and shovels and, and axes and gold pans, that might be my path to riches. So Levi's original label here. This is one of the oldest known pairs of Levi's, uh, 1879, so it's not quite gold rush time. But it looks pretty much like your jeans here today. You might notice there are no belt loops. People didn't wear belts. But there are two strange buttons, one here and one here. And then on the back, you can see there are also two buttons. Well, What's the deal? Yeah, they were suspenders. So they're suspenders look right on their jeans. They look actually pretty comfy. In fact, most of us would wear those. They seem to be washed out about right. They also used to have this little cinch on them so you could change the side. They took that off during World War II because there was a shortage of metal, so that made it interesting to wear. Metal needed to be used for the war effort. But people flood into the air because commercials like this, you know, advertisements, this guy, he looks neat and clean, doesn't look like he's had to work too hard, and the background's pretty, the scenery's nice. He just picks up his gigantic nugget. There's three different ways to get to the gold fields. One is the Oregon Trail. What's the problem for miners on the Oregon Trail or with miners going on the Oregon Trail? It's expensive and dangerous and 
Do you want to spend five months to get there, or do you want to be there now? Now. So expensive, dangerous, and time-consuming. Or, here's one, you could get on a steamship that, uh, that's bound for Nicaragua, which is one of my favorite words to say, Nicaragua. Nicaragua is on the isthmus, that little narrow strip of land that connects North and South America. There is no canal yet that's coming, but it doesn't exist yet for another 60 years. Uh, and it's only going to cost $90, which in today's money would be $3,000. That's still a lot cheaper than the Oregon Trail. And look, it takes, um, somewhere it says how many days, uh, 35 days. Also dangerous. The part they leave off is you would dock on the Atlantic side of Nicaragua. Then you cross over the Isthmus, which is a tropical jungle filled with swamps. Tropical jungles filled with swamps have lots of mosquitoes, and when those mosquitoes bite you, they spread malaria. Then you get on a boat on the Pacific side, and you get to California quickly. Only a month it takes, but you have a really good chance of getting sick, so it's dangerous too. The other way was to take a clipper ship, that's not a steamboat, all the way around South America, might be a little safer than the malaria. It's going to take a little longer, but it's not going to take as long as uh, the Oregon Trail. And it is dangerous uh, going around the, the Horn of South America. So you got to be kind of careful. But either way, they're going to get there one of those three ways. This, uh, so my, I like this picture because it shows Chinese miners intermingling with uh, white miners. The Chinese in California were the most persecuted group. They hated the Chinese. Not sure why. But even among the hatred, they found ways to succeed. They even passed a law in 1850 called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which made it illegal for Chinese miners to own a claim. They couldn't even mine. So they started mining the miners. They opened up laundries, and they started going through the tailings piles, like the leftovers that real miners had gone through. But the, the tool you see here, this guy's holding a gold pan, but this big box here is called a sluice box. It's set at an angle. It's got wooden ripples all the way up it. You dump dirt that you think might contain gold in the top, and then you divert a river or a stream to run through it. And that water from the river or stream with the angle of the sluice box washes off all the lightweight materials and leaves behind in the bottom. So instead of doing one pan at a time, you could do scoop bowls at a time all day long. You could mine a lot of gold this way. Eventually, we find out that most of the miners that go to California aren't going to get rich. In fact, they're going to be so poor that they're going to end up working for a mining company, usually for a, a pay rate of about a dollar a day. And California was a very expensive place to live. In fact, this picture, if you look carefully, they got some big hoses. They're practicing something called hydraulic mining. So they take these big hoses that are high pressure like fire hoses, and they basically wash off the hillsides, run it down through sluice boxes, and get the gold. It's a very efficient way, but environmentally damaging way to mine. These guys have a different kind of sluice box here. And actually, we got Mama here bringing a picnic basket. I'm going to guess they straighten up a little when Mama comes around, probably work a little harder. Women bring with them civility. So when the women show up, they're like, why do we not have a church, but we have four saloons? And the men are like, uh, yeah, we'll get right on that. And where's the school for the kids? And the men are like, yeah, we'll get right on that. And it probably cleans them up a lot. Without women around, there isn't much civilization. Like my house, when my mother was off to school, it was bad. And then she came home, it was bad. How many of you are afraid of your mother? You should be, because I am. Does this guy sort of look like an old man version of Thomas? Yeah, he does look like Or this guy down in the river. Okay, he's holding a gold pan. This one here that I'm going to show you. Okay, this is metal. This is pretty much exactly what these miners would have used at the time. Uh, and they do this, right? they fill this with rocks and water, and they slosh it around, and as they're sloshing it around, the heaviest materials go to the bottom of the pan. The heaviest materials should be 
gold. So as they're sloshing it around and washing it in the river, all the lightweight stuff is going away and gold should be staying in the bottom. I'll pass this around just so you can get an idea. These dudes had to be pretty tough if they're going to pan with this thing all day. This little one that I've got is plastic and it weighs almost nothing. And you might look at it and think, what are these ripples here for? Any ideas? Yeah, because the heaviest stuff is going to catch in the bottom of those ripples, which would be gold, so it has less of a chance of escaping. So I'll pass this one around, and you can think about which one would you rather use if you were down the river all day. We look at some statistics. How many minutes do I have, please? Nine. Perfect. I'm going to try to finish a little quick because tomorrow's class is a little shorter, and they can finish watching the video on their own time if they don't finish it in class. So look at the population. California, before 1849, only 1,000 people. Then gold is discovered, and within a year, 100,000 show up. 380,000 within 10 years looking for gold. $2 billion worth of gold is discovered, about 750,000 pounds of gold. In 1852, another 81 million. 1853 uh, to 1857, 45 million. Look at this. That $2 billion worth of gold in today's money is $58.8 trillion. Trillion is a number that's almost impossible for us to understand. I saw this on Twitter the other day, so I snapped a pic of it, and I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, to understand millions and billions and trillions, see if this makes sense. One million seconds ago, so if we're counting time in seconds, one million seconds ago was 11 days ago. That's a million. A billion seconds ago was 1992. A trillion seconds ago was 31,000 BC. So when we're talking about trillions of dollars, whether it's in the value of the gold pulled out of California or whether we're talking about the national debt, that's a lot of dollars. Every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 31,000 years, 33,000 years. Holy smokes. That's a lot. It's an unfathomable number. You and I can't imagine it. It's difficult to imagine a billion, a billion seconds takes us back to 1992. Imagine having a billion dollars. It would be difficult to spend a billion dollars. 49er, person looking for gold in 1949, 1849, sorry. That's why they're called the San Francisco 49ers, because the people heading to California were there for mostly one purpose. Some, like Lobo Strauss, were mining. This company Levi still exists today. You can still go to Kohl's and buy yourself a pair of Levi's. And migration is movement from one country or location to another. So this is a mass migration across the country. It also changes the settlement pattern because up to this time, we're slowly creeping across the continent. We get about St. Louis area and there's a few people headed west and then all of a sudden gold is discovered and whoosh, jump right over places like Nebraska and Wyoming to get to California because we want the gold. So geography, the timeline, history, culture, gold, trade, all of those things come together for different reasons, and different perspectives of different people to create this mass migration that is our manifest destiny. Any questions before I hit stop? Okay, so you should have about six or seven minutes left, and you have a fairly major assignment to work on. So nobody is sitting doing nothing. Uh, you can at least be brainstorming. What am I going to put in this essay? It's a very broad essay. There's a lot of things you can answer it with that could be correct answers. But you need to pull in some facts and details that I didn't necessarily give you. You can start it, sure. But in five or six minutes, you at least can be brainstorming. What 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 direction am I going with it? Okay. All right. I'm going to shut down. Um, everybody's working, so you're not packing up to go to lunch. If you pack up to go to lunch, I'll make you late for lunch. So work. Stop screwing around.